This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. In this part of the test, you will hear Dr. Steve Saunders interviewing Janet Cooper grandmother of Riley Cooper, a patient with a recent problem. Oh, good morning. It's Mrs. Cooper, is it? Yes, that's right. And who have you brought with you today? Well, I brought my grandson Riley with me because both his parents work, so I often look after him during the day. All right. Well, look, come on in and have a seat. Thank you. Okay, now, what seems to be the problem with young Riley? Well, poor Riley, as you can see if you look at his hands, He's got these red scaly patches and they're always itchy. And he's got some on his knees and his tummy as well. Oh, that's no good. Tell me, how long has this been going on? Well, it flares up from time to time. It's particularly bad just now. But it's only been in about the last year that he started to develop this itchiness. I see. And can you tell me a bit more about the scratching? Does he scratch a lot? Yes, when it gets like it is now, he keeps scratching at it. And as you can see, they become very cracked and weepy. Okay. Has there been any associated infection? No, I haven't noticed that. Well, that's good. Does this condition wake him up at night? Yes, it does sometimes. He wakes up crying, actually, which is really bad and upsets everybody. Yes, yes. Well, it would be hard on the family and, of course, Riley. Yes, definitely. Now, regarding school, has he had to take any days off because of this condition? Well, see, I've taken him out of school today, and he does from time to time as it flares up like it is, and he's upset and we have to keep him home. I see. Okay, now, what have you done to relieve the itching? Well, I use that old-fashioned idea of calamine lotion, but that didn't really seem to help. And my daughter's got some cosmetic creams that are supposed to help, like moisturisers. We tried that too, but they don't seem to work. Yes, I see. Okay, Mrs Cooper, well, let me have a look at Riley first, and we'll see if we can determine what the actual problem is. Okay, I've had a look at Riley. And based on my examination, I think your grandson is suffering from a condition known as eczema. How much do you know about eczema? Um, well, I've heard a bit about it, and that's actually what we suspected. But uh, we really don't know what causes it to flare up. Maybe it's an allergy of some sort. Yes, well, that's sometimes difficult to determine, but let me explain it to you. Eczema is also known as atopic dermatitis and it's an inflammatory skin condition that often occurs in early childhood. Some experts say it might be related to an allergy, but to be honest, the exact causes of this condition are still not known. Oh, well, that's a bit of a worry, isn't it? Yes, look, I totally understand your concern, Mrs Cooper, 
but just let me reassure you that eczema is a self-limiting skin condition. That means that most children will get better after a period of time, even without any treatment. And at this stage, with appropriate management, we can control the rash to some degree. Well, we'll be happy to do anything because it's very hard on the boy. Now, before we talk about these preventative measures, I'd just like to get a little bit of family information, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Now, can you tell me how many people are in Riley's family? Well, there is his mother and father, of course, and he's got an older brother who is nine, and he's got twin sisters who are five, and of course there's me. I have lived with them since my husband died two years ago. I see. And do any of those family members have the same symptoms? No, nobody has shown anything in the family. What about yourself? Have you ever had this kind of problem? No, I haven't. Anyone else in the family? Aunts? Uncles? Well, now that I think of it, um, Riley's aunt, my daughter, I think she had it when she was younger. But I don't remember it going on very long or being as bad as Riley's. I see. Well, one thing we can say about eczema, unfortunately, it does tend to run in families. That means that if one family member has it, then it's quite likely to appear another family member. Oh, well, I hope his brother and sisters don't get it then. Well, as I said, it does run in families, so that if Riley has it, then it's possible that his older brother or younger sisters may develop it. However, I would say that because the risk is very low, there's no need to get alarmed about it at this stage. Oh, well, that's good. Now, apart from these hereditary factors, there are also environmental factors which can contribute to the condition, what we often refer to as trigger factors. So now I'd like to ask you some questions about the home environment. Oh, OK. Well, uh, firstly, food can be a trigger factor. Things such as dairy products, wheat and eggs. Have you noticed if there are any particular things in Riley's diet which could be contributing to his condition? Well, I think he has a very good diet, but I must say he's very fond of eggs, particularly scrambled eggs. It's one of his favourite dishes, and he does eat it quite a lot. I see. And maybe when I think of it, um, I'm not sure, but that could be a factor. Okay, and when you say that, after eating these things like eggs and so forth, does he actually scratch more, or do you notice that the rash develops? Well, I hadn't thought of it, but now that you mention it, maybe. Okay, now eczema sufferers often have itchiness after baths or showers, and it uh, can be caused by soaps, medicated soaps, Things like that can trigger the itching. Well, as a family, we just buy whatever soaps are on special at the supermarket. We just get ordinary soaps to use. I see. Well, we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, now bath towels, clothes, sheets and the like can be a major contributing factor and certain products such as wool, which can be quite abrasive, can cause reaction and as a result the rash tends to flare up. Well, of course, he only wears wool things if it's cold in winter. He just wears his ordinary school uniform, which is just a shirt and a pair of shorts. Okay. Are there any pets in the house, Mrs Cooper? Yes, Riley has a dog that he loves, pet dog. And how long has he had that dog? Oh, about a year. I see. Okay, well, you mentioned before he has had this eczema or about a year, or a little bit more. So that is something we might need to look at. Oh dear. Now, are there any smokers in the house? Well, his dad smokes. I see. Does he smoke outside, or does he smoke inside the house as well? Oh, well, quite often he does have a cigarette inside, yes. I've told him to give up, but it doesn't work. I see. Dust mites are another contributing factor. Oh, I vacuum the house regularly. We, we keep the house clean. I am sure there aren't any dust mites. Well, look, that's a really good thing to do, actually. But uh, it can certainly help. However, dust mites can be found in all sorts of places. You know, even amongst stuffed toys and things like that in his bedroom. They often congregate in those areas.
In this part of the test, you will hear a doctor interviewing Alfred Jenkins, who recently suffered a heart attack and has just been transferred from an intensive care ward. Good morning. Mr. Jenkins? That's right. Yes. I'm Dr. Martin. I'm one of the staff doctors at the hospital. I'm, I've just come to uh, acquaint myself with you and to discuss some of your medical problems now that you've moved out into our general ward. Fine. Now, I'll just look at a few details first of all. Now, I understand you're 54. That's right. And you work, uh, your usual work is that of a motor mechanic. Yes, I, I work with the RSEB. Right. And when did you come into hospital? Uh, about four days ago. Right. And, well, we know what the diagnosis is. So perhaps we could just concentrate on the episode that led you to coming into hospital. And perhaps we can go through some of the preceding medical history that you've got over the past few months. Right. What well, actually, what, well, what actually happened? Okay, I, um, I was at work and uh, I just picked up a very heavy battery and was carrying it across the workshop and uh, I got this very severe pain and I had to put the battery down, I had to sit down I can't describe the pain, it was really bad. And uh, I'd, uh, I got anginine and I took some of that, uh, but it didn't have any effect. So I got my mate Bill to drive me to Box Hill, they put me in intensive care. Now, did they give you anything for relief of your chest pain? When I got to the hospital, yeah. Okay. yeah. And did you have any chest pain after that time? Um, yeah, I've had a little bit, but not, not as severe. Was that on the first day or was that subsequent days? Yeah, uh, every day since I've had a little bit of chest pain. I see. How long does that chest pain last? Not very much, uh, you know, just five, ten minutes. Uh, a little bit painful for about a minute and then it sort of dies away. Would you describe it as more of a discomfort, or does it, is it actually a pain? No, just n nothing like the uh, the actual attack, which was very, very painful. Right. Do you have any shortness of breath with that chest discomfort or pain? Not really. No, I uh, I get tired very easily, uh, but uh, no, not like uh, when I actually had the attack. I was very I couldn't breathe. Uh, I just thought I was going to die. I notice at the moment that you're in bed with three pillows. Do you actually need those three pillows to sleep on, or can you lie down flat? Um, I, ca I can lie down, but uh, it's it's comfortable. I feel more comfortable with the with the height behind me. You don't get short of breath if you lie down flat. No. no. Good. Have you had any other symptoms? Any palpitations? Not really, no, just the, uh, um, I mean, I've, I've had things stuck into me and uh, uh, drugs and whatnot, so um, it's been a bit like a funny dream for the last three or four days. Yes, it's a very complex time. Perhaps I'll just concentrate now on some of the symptoms that you had leading up to this particular problem. I understand you've had chest pain in the past. When did, when did you first develop chest pain? Uh, I had the first problem about two and a half years ago. Uh, I remember the time because I'd just separated from my wife at that time and uh, I, I thought it was indigestion but um, I was advised to go and see the doctor so he, he did tests and things and uh, 
he suggested that I stop smoking and uh, and lose a bit of weight and start eating a bit better and uh, I cut down a bit on my smoking but it gradually crept up again and uh, I stopped drinking beer which helped cut my weight down a bit but uh, I started drinking whiskey instead so I suppose my alcohol intake would have been about the same but, uh, I was a bit more careful about the amount that I ate and uh, I got my weight down a bit but I used to have I had pains um, on off from that time on um, whenever I did anything suddenly um, and uh, but I used to find if I sat quiet for a bit um, it would go away I see with these chest pains did they come on regularly with any particular type of strenuous activity so there weren't there wasn't all that consistent really but um, whenever I had you know, if I picked up something heavy or or was particularly aggressive in the garden, um, or or ran a bit, um, I get the I get the pain. Did you find that you were getting chest pain if you were just walking at a normal speed? No, that was all right. I did take up uh, walking uh, to get a bit of exercise and get the weight down a bit, and but I take it fairly gently, and uh, no, I haven't had any trouble. Did you have any problems with chest pain walking up hills? Well, there aren't too many hills around where uh, I live, so uh, there's nothing really, really steep around there. Right. Now, did the pattern of chest pain change over a period of time, or did it stay much the same? It was much the same, although it seemed, I guess, I was having them more often towards the end, and. Uh, and then about a month ago I got this pain and it didn't go away when I sat down and right. uh, so I thought I'd better go and see the doctor and he uh, he did some more tests and uh, he put me on anginine which um, seemed to do the trick um, up until the heart attack. Right. Um. Did he suggest any other medication apart from the anginine? Uh, no, that's that's all I had. Uh, he he strongly advised me to uh, to give up smoking and uh, um, and uh, to uh, to change my diet. But mm -hmm. see, in the work that I do, I, it's very awkward. I don't have the time to, uh, you know, I've just got to grab fish and chips or hamburger or something on the run. How about cigarettes? You mentioned that you've been a smoker. Yes. Do you still smoke at this time? Uh, not, not anymore. I'm not going to smoke anymore now. Uh, I, I realise how that that's probably the main contributor, and uh, so I, I won't smoke anymore now. Was there any problems with your blood pressure in the past? Yes, I did have, uh, I did have high blood pressure when I had the, the tip when I went to the doctor. It wasn't too high, just a little bit high. Was this the first time you went, or more recently? Both, both times, right. yes. Okay. Perhaps, you, perhaps uh, you could describe to me a little bit more about what you do at work, uh, what the physical requirements are, and, right. yeah. and what other things that you're required to do at work. Well, uh, most of the time I'm driving around in the, in the, the van, and waiting for people to have troubles and then I go and help them out. So it's a lot of sitting in the car driving and uh, and, and then sudden bursts of activity when somebody needs help you've got to uh, uh, sort it out. But uh, the rest of the time I'm in the workshop at Nunawading uh, either doing work on vehicles or um, looking after the apprentices I've sort of more or less taken over looking after what they do and training them and so on. Are you required to do heavy lifting as part of your Yeah, you, you can't really avoid it. Um, I mean, parts of cars are just heavy, that's all. You know, there's, uh, some of the tools uh, are heavy. I mean, a lot of them you can move around on, uh, on trolleys, but 
you know, you've just you've just got to pick it up and take it up to the other side of the workshop. I'd just like to ask you another question about your about your work. Did you, did you ever have problems with getting chest pain when you were driving or in traffic? No, no, I didn't have any problems while I was actually driving. Good. Um, perhaps I'd like to ask you some questions at this time regarding your just your personal life. Um, I understand that uh, you've been married. Yes, yes, and I'm divorced now. Divorced yeah. How long have you been divorced? About 18 months. About 18 yeah. months. Well, that's about the time when you first developed this uh, chest pain. No, at about uh, when I separated, about two and a half years ago, I got started the pains. Uh, and about 18 months ago, we got the divorce. Uh, and about... Uh, Twelve months ago, I started going out with Dorothy. That's my girlfriend. So we've got quite a good relationship, uh, and that's made life a lot more pleasant. I still see my children; they come around, but uh, and I've got a good relationship with them. Although I, I don't ever talk to my wife, I'm afraid. Do you do any physical activities or sports with uh, your girlfriend? Uh, we, we're both interested in gardening, and uh, uh, a bit of fishing, and uh, I help the local drama group uh, with building sets and things like that. And with your children? Um, my daughter and I, we uh, we get on very well, but we, in a, in a gentle sort of way. She's very interested in the theatre too, and. Uh, we uh, we talk a lot, and uh, but with my son, it's more of a physical relationship. Uh, he likes to play physical games, wrestle and romp and throw balls and kick footballs and things. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bit concerned about what will happen there because that's that's really how our relationship works. We it's on a very physical level. And I'm just a bit concerned that. Uh, if I can't play ball games with him, he's going to lose interest and just go off with his mates. Right. I'll just digress here for a minute. Is, is there any family history of heart disease in your family? Uh, yes. My uh, my father uh, he died when he was about oh, in his late fifties. He had a heart attack. And your mother? She's she's still alive. Uh, How old would she be now? She's uh, nearly eighty. Yeah. Is she in good health? No, no she's got very bad arthritis. But no heart problems. But no heart problems. No. I see. What sort of uh, person would you think you are? How would you describe yourself? I'm a good sort of bloke, I suppose. Right. <laughs> I uh, I get on well with people, and uh, I enjoy people's company. I I like working. I really love my job, and I work long hours there. I go in early and I finish late, and uh, I mean that's a, a good day for me. Is is going into work, and spending the morning out on the road, perhaps in the afternoon in the workshop, <coughs> and. Uh, Knocking off about eight and going round to the pub with uh, with some of the lads and having a count of tea and a game of darts and a, and a drink. I see. Are you? Would you describe yourself as being a hard worker? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I put in a good good day's work for a good day's pay. Yeah. So well. You seem a bit concerned about the problem that you've got. I mean, are there any specific worries that you that you'd like to talk about at this point that you've got? Well, I, I mentioned about the about the job. That's uh, a big worry. I mentioned about my son, particularly in playing ball games with him. Uh, the other thing that concerns me is really my relationship with uh, with my girlfriend. Um, become a sort of full 
relationship and I'm just concerned that I'll be able to continue with that sort of physical relationship. Did you have any problems with chest, chest pain during sexual activity with you? I did once, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was about three months ago. But, uh, again, it was a, an attack that went away after I uh, just rested. And did you have any further problems like that? No. no. So it was really just the a one, one, a one yeah. time episode. Okay. Right. When, what do you feel about uh, your ability to return to work? Well, you could probably answer that better than me. I, I'm very keen to return to work, and as soon as possible. And. Uh, I'm just nervous about what I'll be actually able to do. I mean, I, I can still drive the car around, obviously, but as a repair mechanic on the road, you're working on your own. You can't take somebody with you. And uh, sometimes you're required to do heavy work. And I guess I could always call one of the other cars if, uh, if it was something that was heavy. Because, as I say, a lot of the time it's just flat batteries, which is easy. And uh, in the workshop, I guess I've just got to be a bit smarter about what I do and not do heavy jobs. But I still feel I could cope with the, uh, the work. Good. Well, I think to give a more complete opinion of this time, We'll need to examine you. Well, Mr. Jenkins, we've completed the physical examination. There will be a few more tests that we will have done over the next few days. But I'm in a position now, I think, to provide you with some of your answers um, for these problems. My examination findings really would suggest that the problem that you've got now has it certainly is in the process of settling. Your blood pressure is normal and there's no signs of heart failure. So that that's a particularly good sign. As you know there is a graded activity program that you'll find that Initially there will be some problems with this, but if you do have those problems, we would like you to report them to the nurse in charge. The fact that you haven't had a lot, a lot of pain or even any pain at all since the attack is another good sign. And perhaps we wouldn't be expecting this, although this may occur. If you do develop any problems with chest pains, then I'd like you to convey this to the sister in charge of the ward or the doctors who are doing their rounds. There appears to be sort of quite a satisfactory situation now with your heart overall and we'll be quite happy for you to be managed out in the ward. Um, do you have any particular worries about any of this? Oh, if you're, if you're confident then uh, I'm happy. Yes. Well, we'll be checking up again perhaps in the next day or so. If there's any problems in the meantime, we'll be pleased to see you before then. And if you do have any problems, I'd like you to convey those problems to Sister in Charge. All right? Yes. Thanks, Doctor. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time, 
to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now you will hear a talk about ambulatory nursing care. Ambulatory nursing care requires critical reasoning and astute clinical judgment in order to expedite appropriate care and treatment, especially given that the patient may present with complex problems or potentially life-threatening conditions. Ambulatory care registered nurses provide care across the lifespan to individuals, families, caregivers, groups, populations, and communities. Ambulatory care nursing occurs across the continuum of care in a variety of settings, which include but are not limited to hospital-based clinic centers, solo or group medical practices, ambulatory surgery and diagnostic procedures centers, telehealth service environment, university and community hospital clinics, military and veterans administration settings, nurse-managed clinics, managed care organizations, colleges and educational institutions freestanding community facilities, care coordination organizations, and patient homes. Ambulatory care registered nurses interact with patients during face-to-face -face encounters or through a variety of telecommunication strategies, often establishing long-term relationships. Telehealth nursing is an integral component of professional ambulatory care nursing that utilizes a variety of telecommunications technologies during encounters to assess, triage, provide nurse now you will hear about cleaning patient care equipment. Cleaning is the act of removing visible organic residue, e.g., blood and tissue, and inorganic salts from patient care equipment, and preparing it for safe handling and further decontamination. Cleaning should be accomplished using water with detergents or enzymatic products that are capable of removing visible organic and inorganic residues. In home care, cleaning is done manually with friction, i.e., rubbing or scrubbing the soiled item by hand with a cloth to remove soil and fluidics, i.e., using a detergent or enzymatic product with water, a technical way of describing the process of cleaning by the good old soap and water method. Another cleaning method is mechanical cleaning and can be accomplished through a washer disinfector, e.g., dishwasher. Patient care equipment must be thoroughly cleaned before it can disinfected. This includes getting into the nooks and crannies, i.e., in crevices, serrations, joints, and lumens of instruments, devices, or equipment. Patient care equipment should be cleaned as soon as practical after use in the home. Before clean, inspect the equipment's surfaces for cracks or breaks in integrity that would impair either the cleaning or disinfection process and throw out or repair any equipment that cannot be properly cleaned and disinfected. Decontamination is the use of physical or chemical means to remove, inactivate, or destroy pathogens on a surface or item to prevent transmission of infectious agents and render the item or surface safe for handling. Use or disposal, OSHA, 1991. Now you will hear about nasal foreign body removal. Nasal foreign bodies are a commonly encountered problem in and acute practice. Personal experience and previous studies have shown that they occur predominantly in children between 2-5 years old. Children under the age of 5 years have difficulty in nose blowing. Treating this age group of children is challenging, first because of their natural fear of the unknown, and second as they are difficult to restrain. Their unwillingness to cooperate is often exacerbated by previous painful attempts to remove foreign bodies by either parents or other medical professionals. Various methods for foreign body removal have been described such as using a wax hook, old eustachian tube catheter, foley, 
and Fogarty catheters, cupped forceps, hemostats, wiry ear loops, and cyanocrylate glue. All these methods are invasive, can cause trauma to the nasal mucosa, and have the potential risk of further displacing the foreign body with possible aspiration. Several positive pressure techniques have also been described, e.g. using bag valve mask apparatus, oxygen tubing attached to the unoccluded nostril, but none have been widely accepted for regular use. These maneuvers aim to build up positive pressure behind the foreign body, which would then force it out of the nostril. The Burns Kisses is a unique method which works on the same principle, but does not require the child to be restrained, and can be performed by the parent without any physical contact from the attending doctor. The technique was first described by Tiber in 1965 and involves the parent exhaling, whilst kissing their child and occluding the unaffected nostril. During this procedure, the glottis is closed, so there is little risk of barotrauma as with other positive pressure techniques. Moreover, the pressure used is low. It would be comparable to that generated during sneezing, which is about 60 mmHg. The aim of this study was to evaluate the effectiveness of the parent's kisses for removal of nasal foreign bodies in children, and to determine if this technique reduces the number of children requiring general anesthesia. Now you will hear about vaccination. Excluding children from your practice when their parents decline immunizations is not recommended. It can put the child at risk of many different health problems, not just vaccine-preventable diseases. Remember, unvaccinated infants did not decide for themselves to remain unvaccinated. They need your care. Make sure that parents are fully informed about clinical presentations of vaccine-preventable diseases, including early symptoms. Diseases like pertussis and measles are highly contagious and may present early as a nonspecific respiratory illness. Parents who refuse vaccines should be reminded at every visit to call before bringing the child into the office, clinic, or emergency department when the child is ill, so appropriate measures can be taken to protect others. When scheduling an office visit for an ill child who has not received vaccines, take all possible precautions to prevent contact with other patients, especially those too young to be fully vaccinated and those who have weakened immune systems. If a parent refuses to vaccinate, you can share the fact sheet. If you choose not to vaccinate your child, understand the risks and responsibilities, which explains the risks involved with this decision including risks to other members of their community and the additional responsibilities for parents, including the fact that, when their child is ill, they should always alert healthcare personnel to their child's vaccination status to prevent the possible spread of vaccine-preventable diseases. You also can tell the parent that you would like to continue the dialogue about vaccines during the next visit and then make sure to do so. You may wish to have them sign up as refusal to vaccinate form each time a vaccine is refused so that you have a record of their refusal in their child's medical file. Now you will hear a nurse talking about the role of nurse in wound care. A nurse who recognizes the early signs of skin disruption can help keep a small problem from turning into a big one. To recognize wounds early, nurses must understand where patients have the highest chance of developing a wound and check that area daily. Diabetics, for example, often develop wounds on their feet because of poor circulation and nerve damage. The elderly and debilitated often develop pressure ulcers open areas on the skin that develop from lying in one position for too long. Some wounds, such as surgical incisions, are inevitable but complications such as infection are not. Other wounds, like pressure ulcers, are preventable with good nursing care. Nurses can decrease wound complications by being proactive about prevention. They can frequently turn patients and examine common wound sites, such as the back and the hip bones. Scrupulous handling and care of wounds helps prevent contamination and possible infection. 
Good nutrition also helps wounds heal. Education always a big part of nursing care teaches patients and families how to avoid complications from wounds. Now you will hear about the usage of peak flow meter. A peak flow meter is a small device that helps you check how well your asthma is controlled. Peak flow meters are most helpful if you have moderate to severe persistent asthma. Measuring your peak flow can tell you and your healthcare provider how well you blow air out of your lungs. If your airways are narrowed and blocked due to asthma, your peak flow values drop. You can check your peak flow at home. Here are the basic steps. Move the marker to the bottom of the numbered scale. Stand up straight. Take a deep breath. Fill your lungs all the way. Hold your breath while you place mouthpiece in your mouth between your teeth. Close your lips around it. Do not put your tongue against or inside the hole. Blow out as hard and fast as you can in a single blow. Your first burst of air is the most important. So blowing for a longer time will not affect your result. Write down the number you get. But, if you coughed or did not do the steps right, do not write down the number. Instead, do the steps over again. Move the marker back to the bottom and repeat all these steps two more times. The highest of the three numbers is your peak flow number. Write it down in your log chart. Many children under age 5 cannot use a peak flow meter very well. But some are able to. Start using peak flow meters before age 5 to get your child used to them. In this part of the test, you will hear a lecture based on the subject of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. What are the symptoms of ADHD? Most kids could be described at some point as inattentive, impulsive or hyperactive. Explanations for this behaviour vary widely, ranging from the child being overtired to overexcited. However, when such behaviour lasts for significant periods of time and when it interferes with, with life at school and at home, the explanation may be due to a condition such as Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. Some studies suggest that about 2% of primary school age children have ADHD, while others have suggested that almost 18% have ADHD. However, the majority of researchers put the figure at between 5% and 10%. Regarding gender, Boys are at least four times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than girls. Prenatal risks. Some studies have shown a possible increase in risk among children whose mothers used cigarettes or alcohol during pregnancy. Therefore, if you are pregnant, do not smoke or use alcohol. Environmental toxins. Exposure to very high levels of lead before age six or so might also raise a child's risk. Some young children are exposed to lead from the dust of worn paint in many older buildings or from drinking water that has travelled through lead pipes. Family history. Having a biological parent or sibling with ADHD seems to raise a child's chances of developing it. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, at least one third of fathers who had ADHD in their youth may have a child with ADHD. For some children who have ADHD, some foods, such as sugar and food colourings, seem to trigger more out-of-control behaviour. But food is not a trigger for many children with ADHD. 
Being at a party often triggers out of control behaviour, which might be due to foods, but the behaviour is more likely to be due to too much excitement. Sleep apnea, blocking of the airway during sleep, is linked to problem behaviours in many children. Some research has shown that about 30% of children who have ADHD have some sleep apnea. Signs of sleep apnea include snoring, often loud snoring, and stopping breathing for a brief time during sleep. Not all children who snore have sleep apnea, but if a child with ADHD also snores, this might be part of the problem. Despite at least 40 years of research worldwide, there is still no clear explanation for why ADHD happens in some children. More recent theories suggest that there is a problem with how the front part of the brain works. This causes the child's brain to deal with information and feelings in a different way from other children. It is comprised of three core symptom categories, which are hyperactivity, poor concentration and impulsiveness. In order to reach an accurate diagnosis, the presence and pattern of development of symptoms in each of these categories must be considered. Hyperactivity. Children always seem to be on the go or constantly in motion. Hyperactive behaviour may be demonstrated by a difficulty in playing quietly, excessive fidgeting, continuous talking, Restlessness, inability to sit still when required, poor concentration. Children have a hard time keeping their minds on any one thing and may quickly become bored with the task. Signs that a child is inattentive include disorganisation, poor academic performance, being distracted easily, forgetfulness, losing things, and poor completion of tasks. Impulsiveness. Children seem unable to curb their immediate reactions or think before they act. Impulsive behaviour may be identified through disruptive behaviours in the classroom, such as interrupting other children, poor turn-taking, blurting out answers before they are appropriate, rejection by their peers and classmates, as well as accidental injury. How ADHD affect young people? People with ADHD may not do as well at school as they are capable of because it is so hard to concentrate and stay still. In addition, school work gets harder as you get older and it may become more and more difficult to keep up with the work. Furthermore, if no one knows they have ADHD, it may mean that they do not get the special help they need. As they get older, they are expected to take more responsibility for their own learning and behaviour, and to be more organised in order to do this. This can be hard with ADHD. For young people who are not able to plan and organise themselves, for example, they don't hear the teacher's instructions, they lose assignments and homework, school gets very difficult. This can result in poor marks, being kept back in lower grades, lower self-esteem and confidence, as, as well as regular truancy. This may in turn mean that they drop out of school early, and leaving school early means they will reduce their chances of finding suitable employment. I would now like to describe the treatment options available for ADHD sufferers. Stimulants are the most common type of medication prescribed for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They have the longest track record for treating ADHD and the most research to back up their effectiveness. The stimulant class of medication includes widely used drugs such as Ritalin, Adderall and Dexedrin. Stimulants are believed to work by increasing dopamine levels in the brain. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter associated with motivation, pleasure, attention and movement. For many people with ADHD, stimulant medications boost concentration and focus while reducing hyperactive and impulsive behaviours. 
Stimulants for ADHD come in both short and long-acting dosages. Short-acting stimulants peak after several hours and must be taken two to three times a day. Long-acting or extended release stimulants last eight to 12 hours and are usually taken just once a day. The long-acting versions of ADHD medication are often preferred since people with ADHD often have trouble remembering to take their pills. Taking just one dose a day is much easier and more convenient. As with all medications, there are side effects and the most common side effects of stimulants for ADHD are difficulty sleeping, loss of appetite, headaches, upset stomach, irritability, depression, mood swings, racing heartbeat, dizziness. ADHD stimulant safety concerns. Beyond the potential side effects, there are a number of safety concerns associated with the stimulant medications for ADHD. Effect on the developing brain. The long-term impact of ADHD medication on the youthful developing brain is not yet known. Some researchers are concerned that the use of drugs such as Ritalin in children and teenagers might interfere with normal brain development. Heart-related problems. ADHD stimulant medications have been found to cause sudden death in children and adults with heart conditions. The Heart Association recommends that all individuals, including children, have a cardiac evaluation prior to starting a stimulant. An electrocardiogram is recommended if the person has a history of heart problems. Psychiatric problems. Stimulants for ADHD can trigger or exacerbate symptoms of hostility, aggression, anxiety, depression and paranoia. People with a personal or family history of suicide, depression or bipolar disorder are at particularly high risk and should be carefully monitored when taking stimulants. Potential for abuse. Stimulant abuse is a growing problem, particularly among teens and young adults. University students take them for a boost when cramming for exams or pulling all-nighters. Others abuse stimulant medications for their weight loss properties. The important diet. Current scientific evidence also suggests that diet modification can improve the behavioural symptoms of ADHD. A trial in children without ADHD challenged them with drinks containing artificial food colours and additives, or a placebo, and reported significant increases in hyperactive behaviour amongst the children who received the intervention compared to the children who received the placebo. A trial of 27 children with ADHD randomly assigned them to an elimination diet or no intervention and reported significant behavioural improvements amongst the elimination diet group. These and a number of other studies demonstrate the association between diet and behaviour. They also demonstrate that strict adherence to an elimination diet can reduce hyperactive behaviour in children. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42 In this part of the test you will hear a lecture based on the subject of cardiac investigation. For questions 37 to 42, complete the notes with a word or short phrase.
My name is Dr Neil Strathmore. I'm a cardiologist and today I'm going to talk about cardiac investigations and try and tell you which test is right for which patient. Patients who present with heart problems present with a variety of symptoms such as chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, syncope and edema. In addition, patients come along because a problem has been picked up by another doctor, such as high blood pressure, a heart murmur, an abnormal lipid profile, or patients present for assessment of cardiac risk to see whether they're likely to have a heart attack. Let's look at the most common cardiac symptom that presents, which is chest pain. Obviously, the first thing to do is to take a careful history of the pain, where it is and how severe it is, and in particular its relationship to exertion. Often patients don't describe this as a pain, but as a pressure. The examination is often not helpful in uh, trying to sort out the cause of chest pain, but one should note the blood pressure and see if there are any cardiac murmurs because aortic stenosis can also cause chest pain. It's important to note the risk factors. A technique that's very useful for assessing cardiac risk is to use the uh, population data from the Framingham study in the United States to assess 5 and 10 year cardiovascular risk. It's important to remember that women often have an atypical history of pain. So the next step is to do some sort of test to look uh, for the cause of the chest pain. And most of the tests are what are called functional tests, which see the effect of stress or exercise on the heart and see whether that changes something which can give us a diagnosis. The simplest test is an exercise ECG. The patient exercises on a bicycle or a treadmill while an ECG is being recorded. The uh, parameters that are measured are the heart rate and blood pressure and then changes on the ECG, in particular ST depression. ST depression occurs because ischemia occurs during exercise. This is a relatively simple test and inexpensive the main problem is that its sensitivity and specificity are probably only of the order of 70 to 80 percent and seem to be a lot lower in women. Remembering that the test can be inaccurate means that a patient who has a very good story of chest pain that sounds like angina and has multiple risk factors should still be considered to have angina even if the exercise test is negative. Thank you.